Okay, well, I think, I think we will, uh, I think we'll get started. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, this is, uh, this is actually the, the first public lecture that uh, we've done at uh, Chemistry World uh, since uh, I took it over uh, this summer. Uh, so I'm excited to see everyone here. And, uh, you know, basically, I really thank you for all of your, uh, you know, support to Science Circle um, every week. And, uh, you know, especially uh, thank you for uh, taking time on what for one of, for many of you is uh, Saturday morning. Uh, let's see. So um, there's uh, just I'm just keeping an eye on the uh, nearby chat as well. Okay, so uh, what are the recent developments at uh, Chemistry World? Well, let me let me start the talk. Uh, yeah, there's an abstract. Um, there's uh, going to be a PDF of my talk up on the Science Circle website. Uh, so that's why some of my slides are kind of wordy. I'm not going to go over every word. I know that acknowledgements usually come at the end of a talk, but I often forget to do them. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to just kind of start by acknowledging all of you in the science circle for uh, your attention. Um, current NSF funding, uh, chemistry grant, uh, that uh, particular one, uh, which uh, helps support uh, the science circle region. Uh, my own research students, uh, especially Dustin, uh, who has being a good sport and uh, giving up part of his Saturday morning to uh, uh, co-present with me. Um, my collaborator, George, of course, uh, we collaborate on the NSF grant. Funding for us, this region uh, this year um, is coming from the Department of Chemistry. And as always, I've got uh, support from the College of Arts and Sciences and the grad school. So, and of course, I am grateful to everyone for their attention. So, story so far, um, Chemistry World was uh, put together uh, a few years ago um, as a joint project of, uh, between um, Dr. Wendy Keeney Kennicutt. She's Dr. K in uh, Second Life. And, from Texas A&M and Kurt Winkleman, uh, who was at Florida Tech at the time, he, he's moved to take a um, chairship at a different department. Um, they received a NSF grant, uh, and part of that grant was to develop this region, report on the use of Second Life uh, for uh, chemistry education, given the actual uh, grant information there. So we've had two talks in Science Circle by Kurt Winkleman. He gave a talk summarizing uh, their findings um, from Chemistry World, and he actually gave a tour of the region uh, last year. So uh, I do want to also mention uh, Zandi Mars and Random Cole. Uh, they did the bulk of the work to develop uh, the region and activities, and they've done a fantastic job. Just about everything that you see around you here is uh, their work. Uh, except for some of the recent additions that I'll point out. So, uh, you know, basically here's some more words uh, in the PDF, you'll be able to link to uh, uh, their paper. I just wanted to make sure that uh, that got in the talk. The, um, an important summary would be that uh, you know the text in italics that I've got here. Overall, the results of this pilot study suggest that the virtual worlds can be effective for teaching chemistry experiments. And this and their work was uh, the first account of student learning and attitudes after performing college level experiments in uh, Second Life. Uh, so it represents a, a huge amount of work. So uh, another plug, uh, Curious George is here. He gave an excellent talk last week about Vertec uh, and uh, his introduction had an excellent summary of the pros and cons uh, regarding Second Life. I will uh, direct you to watch that talk if you weren't there or weren't able to see it. Um, it was a very, very good, um, good one, very thought provoking for educators, okay? And I agree with, um, I agree with the um, pros and cons. 
Okay, so let's tell you a story now. Stories are more fun than uh, thanking people and um, you know thanking funding agencies. So in summer of 2020, I was assigned to teach uh, Chem 135, uh, which was the uh, freshman chemistry for engineering lab uh, during during this fall as part of my teaching load. And as you know, we were in the midst of a pandemic, so you know it wasn't even clear if we would have in-person activities uh, possible. So we kind of had to worry about. Um, developing a plan for in-person activities, and we also had to simultaneously develop plans to uh, teach teach online. So I asked Dr. K and Dr. Winkleman if we could use Chemistry World for classes uh, because the uh, content here that was existing at the time was perfect for at least uh, two of the labs that we would like to teach. Uh, and during those conversations, I found out that since the NSF grant had um, run out and um, Dr. K had retired, the region was no longer being paid for. Uh, so uh, you, as you know, we've seen a lot of regions just go away in Second Life, taking with them um, taking with them um, hours and hours, like weeks of content, uh, weeks of work. So I didn't want that uh, to happen. So, um, you know, one of the things I was able to do was convince my colleagues of using um, the Second Life content in, in our lab. And uh, I was especially happy to be able to obtain funding from SIUE, which is our school. Um, my uh, department chair, Dr. O'Brien, was very supportive. So, um, you know, SIUE, our school, uh, is a, what you would call a comprehensive master's institution. I wouldn't call us an elite school uh, by any means. Um, the Enrollment is about 14,000 students. We are located uh, near, near St. Louis. We're about, um, uh, oh, I'd say uh, 15, 20 miles northeast of St. Louis, and we're on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River. So we're technically in, um, in southern Illinois. So having, uh, you know, having uh, students in um, labs is an important part of uh, what we do because we train them for bigger and better things. Getting good uh, lab materials, especially ones that are already extant and not making them go away, it was an important uh, part of what we wanted to do. Uh, so in June 2020, uh, working with Dr. K and working with Linda Labs, I took over stewardship, and I like to use that word stewardship, of this uh, region. Um, so um, <laughs> this wasn't a simple process. I, um, you know, before taking taking over, uh, I had to get approvals from a chair, from our information technology services, from the lawyers, uh, and you know, basically uh, making sure that I would follow our SIUE policies. Uh, finally, I got permission. Then talked to marketing about you know how to put a little bit of branding um, on on the site. I just put up three signs, and I worked. Uh, with uh, marketing uh, to, to do that. Uh, my goal here is not to make any, um, or not to make any major changes to the existing content. Uh, what uh, Zandi and Random developed uh, for uh, the labs here uh, works very well. Um, I've added a few things here and there, but uh, you know, I'm not, don't, it's not my business, I feel, to uh, mess with what was developed with the NSF, um, NSF uh, grant. So um, just a bit of a preview will um, take you uh, up to the platforms a little bit later. The existing content, there's a gas laws experiment. Uh, essentially, you collect gas um, in a uh, graduated cylinder, um, and you use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, uh, knowing pressure, knowing um, the volume, knowing the temperature, you work back to a number of moles, uh, and you figure out uh, molecular weight for the particular gas that you're uh, using. Uh, ends up being a, a very nice 
very nice experiment. Uh, the other experiment that was extant on the site is called precipitation titration. Um, titration is a type of, uh, it's called volumetric analysis. So just the word volumetric. Volume, of course, is like, you know, how much of a liquid you might have. A volumetric is measuring just uh, volumes uh, very uh, precisely. If you were a chemist in the year 1900, volumetric uh, analyses would be your life. Uh, basically, analytical chemistry and titrations um, um, back then were almost synonymous. Okay, and again, we'll show you that um, on on the tour. Okay, so one of the things that uh, one of the things that came with the region that uh, uh, Random and uh, Zandi developed was the TA HUD, as I'm calling it. And I've just moved it forward a little bit. Now I'll just move it in, in front of the screen for, for, for a bit. Um, so so a HUD, a heads-up display, there we go. A heads-up display, whoa, is simply a, um, is simply a, um, object in Second Life, but uh, instead of materializing it, resing it in um, the Second Life screen, uh, you just attach it to your, um, to your screen. Uh, these things are just built from, um, these things are just built from prims and scripted as you normally would script any object in Second Life and then, um, you know, you put it in your inventory, you would wear it on the screen. I've blown this one up. Uh, the HUD is really, really useful. Um, and let's see, in this box, and I'm going to move that in front of you. If you click on that box, uh, you can get a copy of uh, the HUD. It'll attach, and, and if you wear it uh, or attach the HUD, it'll um, show up in the lower right-hand uh, corner of your screen. Uh, so then you might want to have that on um, on. on later as we go uh, wandering around. What are the parts of the HUD? Um, well, essentially, um, it allows students who are working on one of the platforms upstairs to call for assistance. Uh, there's a little like panic button on each of the platforms that can appear. Um, there's th those OBS1, OBS2, th those Those are teleport links to observation decks, but we don't um, we don't really use those much. We just use the calls for assistance and the click to teleport, and the home button will actually uh, would actually take you to a um, to to the lab that I'll show you later. So uh, let's see. Um, tag. How does one click on the HUD to be able to wear it? So the little box with kind of the paisley. Um, a cube with Paisley in front of the screen. If you click on that box, it'll give you a copy of the HUD. Then you take that in your inventory. Um, and if you right click when it's in your inventory and uh, say where, it should show up on your screen. Okay. All right. So let me move that out of the way again. How are you doing, Dustin? I'm doing good. Just just listening and okay uh, <laughs> okay i don't want you to fall asleep there um let me oh, no. let me at this point uh introduce dustin this is dustin pumford uh he's one of my uh students in my research group and uh he was assigned to me as uh a teaching assistant for the uh um lab that we taught this semester uh he was one of five teaching assistants uh and you know, we started working on um, figuring out how to make sure that all the students would have a good experience here uh, in Second Life. We started working on that during the summer, I think. So, yep. so yeah. Um, let me let me advance the slide and see where we are now. Uh, enter. Uh, so, um, just you know, kind of to say what additions I've made to the region. I've added the bioinorganic structures, the big fancy scary structures that you see around you in this corner. There's a DNA with um, 
cis platen attached to it uh, behind the tree. Um, there's a, um, a protein chlorophyll A complex. I think I've got an enterobactin. No, it's a uh, rhodopsin trimer lurking in a lagoon over there. Um, since it's a membrane, transmembrane um, um, protein, I figure having it uh, soaking in water is, is not a bad way of representing it. Um, I've added a few interactive activities. Uh, so for example, um, the solid state activity, which is the checkerboard over to um, the right of the screen as you're looking at it. Uh, and, you know, some objects which uh, res large temporary structures. So for example, let's see, I'm going to click on, oh, it won't let me click from this distance. There we go. There is a tiny little thing, tiny little thing next to uh, the checkerboard that will res a fairly good definition model of a COVID protein. That's a 2000, uh, well, it's not 2000 prims, but it, it uses, uh, um, you know, 2000 or more uh, prim equivalents, I forget what you call them, um, of the region's resources. That's why uh, anything big like that is only a temporary structure. It lasts a couple of minutes, then it goes back, then it goes, then it goes away. And I see someone's found the um, orbital resin uh, boxes that I have around here. And again, um, they're about 50, um, 50 um, prim equivalents each, uh, but they're temporary and they go away. So as long as we have a good buffer of capacity left on the um, region, uh, people can um, manifest res uh, big objects that are not permanent and don't like shut down what uh, other things can happen on the region. So those are a few things that I've developed here. Um, let's see. Thanks for putting up with me as I navigate around here. Uh, so, um, you know, what, what are my plans for the spring? I'm teaching a fourth year bioinorganic class. So that's how these uh, bioinorganic structures, I've got nine people in it. So I'm gonna get them used to Second Life and um, have them uh, do some activities in here. I uh, haven't really 100% planned all of that out yet, but I did wanna mention it. So getting back to our story of um, summer, in, in July, we were um, given permission to actually do um, in-person labs, but with reduced lab capacity. So instead of having sections of 24, we had sections of uh, 10 students. So we went up from, I think, like five sections up to 14. Uh, so um, what what I decided to do is that we'd go ahead with uh, some in-person activities, but kind of schedule more and more online and Second Life activities for the mid to the end of the semester. Because, uh, you know, with winter approaching, you know, from the perspective of July with winter uh, approaching and uh, Thanksgiving and everything, then we kind of thought that there was a chance that the um, classes would be uh, turned online again, as they were in um, uh, March of this year. And in fact, uh, no in-person classes for the last two weeks of the semester were allowed. So uh, the having Second Life activities then would be a, a real boon. So uh, the four activities that we planned uh, were the gas laws and precipitation that were already existing, um, and an intro, uh, and which, which happened really early on. And then the solid state modeling experiment, which was completely new. Oh, and uh, plus we started asking students to register, get their accounts uh, started in July. Uh, and that was kind of a continuing problem because uh, we're working with um, 18 year olds, 19 year olds, uh, and uh, some of them, uh, you know, let things drag on until October. Um, 
but we were able to do. So um, briefly, why a second, a solid state structure experiment? Hey, Dustin, did you teach the solid state structure experiment in person? I did. I've taught both in person and second life for this experiment. Tell me about the in person one. So the in person one, um, solid state tends to be a tough um, concept for freshman chemistry students in general. Um, but the in-person one um, does have a few issues. I remember, you know, this, um, this picture of the model we have there, at least when I was teaching, somebody from a previous class had, you know, broken it or some glue had fallen off. And, you know, you have a bunch of students getting confused on that. And sometimes it's hard to, um, you know, cut through the middle of a model to see uh, the packing in certain ways. Right. So, um, and, and constructing them is fiddly. Yes. Yeah. So uh, fiddly and frustrating and, uh, it, and it's actually been something that my colleagues and I, uh, my chemical education colleague, uh, Dr. Whittaker, um, was working with me on trying to develop a similar activity using Unity over the past year and a half. Uh, and I think they made some good progress, uh, except pandemic hit. So, uh, you know, we wanted to... We wanted to update this activity. Uh, let's see, looking at the uh, chat, I see uh, George is asking about um, how to make structures. Yeah, the big um, COVID-19 structure, all of the big structures I made, uh, and uh, I, can, I can help with that. I can even actually just uh, give you copies of uh, some of the structures I have if you like. Um, let's see. So, you know, if you're going to develop an experiment from scratch, it's not and implement it in Second Life. It is not a simple thing to do. Uh, you know, one of the one of the problems with Second Life and um, Second Life uses for education uh, from uh, the early days was that people would code objects and then try to cram what they build into their pedagogy. And that just doesn't work. Uh, we have to design experiments first to um, be cognizant of learning objectives and then do the coding so that the learning objectives can be met. Uh, so some of the influences I had, um, I would strongly recommend if you're going to develop stuff for teaching in Second Life, looking at Greg Perrier's Teaching in Virtual Worlds guide. I think we've got that on the um, on the um, second or on the Science Circle uh, website. Uh, it's in its third edition now, so there were there are a lot of good tips. Um, I also uh, worked with um, Science Circle members in 2018 and 2019. I, I, I just didn't have it in me to do one this year. There was uh, so much going on uh, for the, um, and we wrote proposals for the Advancing Informal Science Learning Program. One of the things that we really pushed hard was universal design uh, for learning uh, principles. So what is that? Uh, so, in a nutshell, you start with the pedagogy, you ask yourself what your goals are and what background support is necessary. Then you have to decide how to implement um, those uh, goals with hopefully flexible methods and materials like what we have available to us here in Second Life. So, but you also need background materials, so videos and links to um, other material, um, other supports such as having uh, teaching assistants and office hours, uh, you know, to do a good job on the pedagogy, um, there has to be some social aspect of learning. At least that's, uh, that, that's what seems to work at our institution. Uh, so again, uh, deciding how the activity will tie back to each of the pedagogical goal and uh, how to plan for um, assessment of these goals uh, is all part of this. And finally, once you've made some plans uh, and thought about what the pedagogy is going to be, it's time to start building or coding an activity, um, you know, which is 
kind of the more fun part of all of this. So I put together a white paper. It ended up being about, um, you know, five or six pages uh, long. And I included all of these details, details, details. Um, so there were desired learning outcomes. What do we want people to know about um, solid state structures? Well, I'm not going to bore you with um, with the uh, reading all of these uh, um, details here, but I, I will point out that we started out with uh, clear goals um, for what we wanted uh, to teach and what we wanted students to get out of it. And this will all be in the PDF. So if you want to look at it in more detail, it'll be there. Uh, so, you know, the second stage was uh, planning for learners. Uh, you know, and uh, we found the links that we needed to have, uh, or we made um, video pre-labs or planned on video pre-labs. And, uh, you know, having the TAs walk students through the activity um, first. Um, so, so, Dustin, we had a number of times during the semester when we started with students um, or when we brought students into uh, Second Life. Um, you know, starting in uh, July and August, we were inviting them to make their accounts uh, the week of, um, oh, the week of Labor Day uh, for scheduling reasons, uh, basically had them come in, make sure they had their accounts, join a group uh, that uh, would allowed us all to communicate with each other. Uh, they had to send me their um, avatar name from their SIUE email account so that they could, um, so that I could double check who was in the group and make sure that we had some security there. Uh, and, you know, basically, uh, let's see, that, that week they were sending, uh, sending me some selfies of uh, themselves in uh, various places in the, um, in, in Second Life. Uh, so since I didn't do the direct stuff with TAs uh, or with, um, with students rather, um, I, I call on uh, Dustin. How did that week go? Um, yeah, that week went pretty well. The, they're signing up and uh, most of them signed up. Of course, um, there's always going to be a few who um, kind of linger on and, um, you know, don't sign up, but um I would say overall we have most, most of those students are um, getting in pretty easily and signing up. Uh, yeah. No so, we, so we had what a hundred and we ended up with about 120 students uh, for the semester. And after that week, it was a hundred that I had the avatar name for who had joined the group. And then uh, those last 20, it was like pulling teeth to get them to uh, join the group. And some of them never did. And so I just put them on the access list for the uh, region. Um, what I did not want was um, just random folks coming in when we were teaching Second Life Labs and griefing students. Uh, so, you know, those weeks when we had the labs running, I had uh, access limited to only people in the group. So let's see. Yeah, the le learning curve. Sumo has a great uh, point here. How long does it take them to get up to speed with Second Life? So I'm going to ask Dustin this. Uh, since uh, So Dustin, um, in the summer, do you remember your first experience with Second Life? Yes, I do. Um, you showed me around, um, showed me the TA um, HUD and kind of took me on a little tour through the region. Um, then also you put me in touch with Zandi Mars, who's one of the creators of the region. And she kind of um, showed me a little bit more in depth, you know, about the region, how it works. Um, I would say for those students, uh, when they um, got on and doing the experiments, it'd probably take them about uh, 15 minutes to learn the mechanics of each experiment. Um, you know, okay. what, what buttons to click, how to um, work through the menus. Um, so usually I would beforehand, I would, you know, go up to the labs with them, kind of give them a demo of what to do. Um, but it was, I mean, it only take a couple minutes before they, you know, got the ball rolling and figured out how to do the experiment. 
Right. So the students, once they were in, didn't really have um, a problem with the learning curve of using stuff in Second Life. Uh, I was just kind of getting them in uh, and getting them in the groups so that we could have security. Um, George has a great question here. A question for Mike. Did no one at your university make an issue of the adult content in SL? Actually, no one did. Uh, and, you know, I did address it. Uh, when I was asking permission, but I also pointed out um, that we're using the internet a lot for teaching now, and there's a lot of um, adult content on the uh, internet. So we can't, um, you know, we can't say that the whole of the internet is bad just because there's some CD parts. Um, but when what I learned from your talk last week, George, that we could. Um, uh, work with uh, uh, Linden Labs to uh, create a portal where uh, students would have a rated PG or M avatar. I really like that. And going forward, if we do more of this stuff, I think that's uh, what I would like to negotiate. I think I could surely get our um, university on board with that. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, bureaucrats and the other self um, appointed protectors, uh, they, they tend to listen to me. I'm in, I'm in good with them. So um, I'm not, I, I didn't really get much uh, uh, feedback uh, from, from them. And honestly, where students choose to go on their own time uh, is, is not something that any of us are really, um, you know, have the right to criticize. So yeah, uh, so anyway, this slide uh, is just an excerpt from my plan for implementation. This goes on for pages and pages and pages. Just in the green, uh, you know, having whatever text and then supports learning outcome 1A. This was developed before any um, anything can, uh, or any, any uh, development of activities happen. Yeah, and I, I agree, um, you know, uh, academia in the US is, um, is very uh, uh, conservative uh, right now about um, you know things that things that can be seedy, but again, um, it may be that there is a bit of a difference between um, East and West Coast and uh, the Midwest. Our my my um, colleagues, administrators, and students seem to be very practical, so. Uh, let's see, going, going back to the next slide. So yeah, tour preview. Uh, so um, let me move the solid state experiment over here a little bit uh, closer to you. Uh, let's see, edit, and then move the whole thing. Ah. I've moved it behind the edit buttons. OK, there we go. So that, that ended up being um, being what we developed. Let me move that out of the way. And move you down, edit, down, click. Hey, Dustin, do you want to build a simple cubic model? I can do that. Go ahead. So we got to make sure that the z-axis spacing is right first. OK, so he's um, pulling up a menu and uh, choosing um, what the spacing between layers of atoms will be. OK, layer one, layer two. We'll just put on all these layers. And layer four. All right, and this is the simplest model we can build. It's called simple cubic, and you basically see how all the atoms stack. It's not the most efficient way of packing atoms together. Uh, and it's actually kind of rare for like a metal alloy to have this uh, structure. Um, I thought thallium had this structure, but it might be actually a um, uh, like a rubidium or something like that. Uh, there's only like a few metals that actually have this structure. Um, Let's see. Hey, Dustin, could you maybe expose 
like a one 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 face. Okay. Good Let luck with that. See if I. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the students would have um, issues with this, so we we do transparency, and we would go with the corners. So transparency corner six. I don't know if I quite got it. It's almost something like that, but I don't think I quite got it. I got one more to do. We'll do corner one on that guy. And there then, then it's like a slice out of that uh, crystal, right? So uh, one of the things that is important uh, for material science is um, when you have these different structures is like how to slice through them to expose different crystal faces. Uh, polonium, polonium is, is, is that. Yes, you're right. Um, so, you know, basically this is one of the simpler uh, structures that we have. Uh, and, you know, how this thing works? Well, how it works is um, described in videos. You can see that there's kind of a pink sphere just floating off to the side that says, click me for links to useful web pages. And one of the web pages is a frequently asked uh, questions page. And I made a whole set of videos that actually guide students through, um, through the experiment. Um, and one of them is uh, just a pre-lab that I did as a, uh, I, well, I call it a chalk talk, but it's actually pen and paper. Um, so you can see um, that I'm describing unit cells and the like. And, you know, the activity up on, um, is up on uh, platforms. Students can play with it back up there. Uh, I see built a simple cubic model. Um, you know, finally, assessment. One of the things I did not do this semester because uh, A, there's no time, and B, we're building, uh, trying to build quickly to uh, provide educational stuff for uh, students. I didn't get a um, IRB for actually doing a um, uh, in-depth publishable chem ed uh, program, um, um, paper on uh, th this material. I figured we needed to have at least one round of people going through and giving us some informal feedback and uh, so we can improve before we uh, publish any anything on, on there. Um, you know, for me, the most important part was uh, the feedback from the TAs this semester. Um, so, Dustin, feedback from TAs. What would you change? Um, one of the one of the first things that I would change is just um, you know getting them all signed up during that syllabus week of lab. Um, I think that would just make it a lot easier for everybody to you know, all get in at once um, with that. Um, there's not too much I would change, actually. I think that they um, did pretty well with the experiments. Um, like I said, it just took them, you know, 15, 10, 15 minutes to um, get used to the experiments. And, um, you know, that's, that's not really anything different from when they're doing stuff in person. Uh, no, it probably takes them less time to figure out the computer than uh, yeah. calculus, for yeah, sure. Yeah, then because <laughs> because you know in person they're a little more cautious maybe about setting themselves on fire. Yes, and we don't <laughs> we don't want I that. Do, I do have a funny story. Back in 2012, we decided to go from using Bunsen burners in the lab to using uh, electric hot plates because we had one semester, um, three incidents where people turned off their Bunsen burner, then moved it by grabbing the top, like immediately after, like the part where fire was coming out, they, they grabbed the top and moved it. So, you know, very minor burns, but uh, we decided at that point that, that uh, we just needed to uh, do something else. So, um, what I would love to do right now is just actually take you on a bit more of a tour. So we're gonna go uh, for a walk. 
So uh, I think we'll go back to kind of the uh, training area first. And then we'll wander into the building and we'll show you in the building and then we'll go up to one of the platforms. Fair enough. So I'm going to stand and uh, let's see. Let's, uh, well, follow me. And oh, hey, you can see my molecule pet. I, I built a molecule pet. That's. Uh, it's a uh, porphyrin nitrosyl compound. It's one of uh, my former students who went to work with George at uh, University of Oklahoma made this molecule. And so uh, it's a uh, lovely little uh, structure that follows me around. It gets very lonely when I teleport and come zooming. All right, so one of the nice things about the um, IceCast server is you can hear me throughout the region. Uh, and I've also set up um, chat relays for the region, um, like especially like in the places where we are going to. Uh, I haven't set them out throughout the region, so there may be some blank spots in coverage. All right, so anything you type in uh, the parts where we go to, you should be uh, rebroadcast. Okay, so this is the usual landing point. Uh, and if fo folks had uh, um, landmarked the place, I put up some teleport um, nodes to get back to where we did the presentation. The presentation area was uh, brand new. Uh, I had actually just set all that stuff up in the last 72 hours. It wasn't really a good kind of amphitheater on the region. I may work on that and kind of make it so that it's a better place to be. So um, we're in a corner of the sim where we have uh, set up uh, burettes. Let's see, I'll walk over to a burette. Piece of glassware. It's a piece of glassware that you use to measure the amount of liquid that has been delivered. And it's essentially a long tube with markings on and a valve. I don't know if the valve works. No, the valve doesn't work here. But this is supposed to um, help students to figure out how to use their camera to zoom into things. I made videos on zooming into things so students could uh, kind of see what I see when I was uh, talking to them about uh, zooming into things. Uh, there's like a lab coat available here with goggles. Uh, you kind of have to have the more cartoony avatar. Uh, they don't work with mesh avatars. Um, and so in, in this region, it's essentially kind of the setup and the training um, zone so that students are uh, maybe during that first week when we're getting them uh, with all of their um, accounts set up, we would do um, this region a little more. So I'm going to wander into the building. I love that there's um, like gum and places to sit everywhere in uh, the region. We don't have anywhere to surf and we don't have any uh, vehicles. All right, I'm walking over the bridge and I'm going to go into the building. See, Dustin is flying over there already. <laughs> Dustin, you really like flying, don't you? I do. <laughs> <laughs> it, gets, it gets you from place to place. Uh, point place A to, to point B. Quickly. <laughs> so uh, this is actually a replica of one of the chemistry buildings uh, on the uh, Texas A&M campus, I believe. Uh, and um, so let's see. Over over here, we've got a couple of offices. I held my office hours exclusively in Second Life this semester. I got to say, I didn't have much in the way of traffic. Um, but I did want to encourage my students to come into Second Life. Uh, I would kind of sit in this office. I had a whiteboard set up. Uh, and on request, I'd start a Zoom session if they wanted to. Um, but I did want to make sure that I was in here. Dustin. I think they are losing some sound. We have a couple of people in the music channel saying it's down. Ooh. Okay, weird. 
Uh, let's see. Let's see. So we're, we have lost the stream for this place. Uh, checking. Yeah, it's actually not letting me use the music on mine, actually. Really? Let's see. Media. Okay, so I thought I had set the lab to have the, to, to, to actually have the um, media set up right. Sound. Yep, the sound is working now. Okay, so um, I guess there, I guess the uh, main part of the atrium is a different parcel that I didn't uh, realize was there. So, uh, sorry about that, uh, but again, the main part of the atrium is just the main part of the atrium. Uh, let's see. Um, once everyone is in here, you should be able to hear voice again. Um, this is this is a lovely little setup of a lab. There's not actually any experiments that they do in here. They can do things though, like um, you know wash their wash their eyes out on in the eye wash station if uh if necessary um you know they can wash dishes uh you know i think what i would like to do with uh zandy and random in the future is develop this into like develop this area into a place where we can actually talk about lab safety um you know, so we, we have the eye wash, we have various safety things around the lab. So uh, like the uh, safety shower. And I got to say, in a freshman lab, you're not really going to be handling stuff that uh, is usually, you're not going to handle stuff that's so dangerous that a safety shower and the eye wash are absolutely necessary, but it does happen. Uh, so the hoods are actually those rocket looking things above each of the uh, benches. Uh, this is actually a common design in uh, some labs. They would actually come down to uh, much closer to above where, um, where people are working. Uh, so, so there are actually hoods in here. Um, I do have hoods in my second life or my uh, science circle uh, lab. You can, uh, you can visit my science circle lab where I've got a few of these exhibits up. Um, it's, it's in the skybox. So um, we're going to go and we're going to go. <laughs> this is the hood. Yes. We're going to go up to platform one. And if you've got the HUD, you can click on the one. Or I'm going to wander over to this uh, water molecule, the one where I'm standing. Uh, there's a water molecule. It's rotating. It's got a one on it. All righty. So I'm up on platform one now. So come and follow me. And let me know if sound is still working. Yeah, some of these molecules are very high energy sizzies. So yeah, uh, even the water uh, molecule sends you a kilometer up in the sky. All right, well, welcome. Uh, so this is one of our lab benches. 
I guess. Uh, you have been shrunk down to uh, the size of like a Bic lighter. And, you know, um, the original experiments on the lab bench uh, include the uh, gas laws experiment I was talking to you about. That's kind of where, where I am. Um, D Dustin, what, what, was the, what was the thing the students had the most trouble with with the gas laws experiment? Uh, the gas laws experiment, actually, there were hardly any issues with that. Really? Yeah, I would say that one went the most smoothly. Um, that, that was just them learning how to use um, Second Life. Um, okay. In that. So they weren't, um, I mean, maybe with attaching the tube to the lighter or maybe things like that, but nothing really big with that experiment um, that they had issue with. Maybe um, actually closing the door on the balance. Which they have trouble with in real life. Yes. Um, because there's actually, it actually matters in second life, right? Because there's a little bit of wind that can actually um, keep your mass fluctuating. Okay. So um, let's see. I see. Sizzy, do you have sound yet? There's I think a there's um, a couple of people having issues with uh, the HUD where it um, teleports you. You might just have to go back into the lab and click on the number one molecule. Hmm. So okay. it teleported me and a handful of other people um, back out towards the bleachers when we clicked on the one, I think. Really? Yeah. So, oh. oh, that's um, terrible. So you guys okay, might have I... to just come and click on the molecule for now. Okay. Um, so Dustin, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go downstairs for a second and, 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 and fix that. But uh, uh, so um, for our, for, for, can, can you, can you describe like how we did the, um, how we did the first two of the actual second life lab labs with how, how, you know, students uh, were yeah. able to get help. I'll be downstairs. Yeah, so I'll be back in a sec. So we had three second life lab experiments. So they're all on this bench. Um, you can see in the far corner, we have our um, solid state model right in front of us. We have the um, molecular mass. And then way over on the left side, we have our titrations experiment. So for our first two, which were the molecular mass and solid state, students had the option of doing it um, at home or coming into the lab to do it on the computers um, in case they had, you know, any questions so I could answer it right there or um, get any technical difficulties figure out. Um, such as if, you know, if there was one student who wasn't signed up or in the group. Um, so most students actually came in um, to the lab to do that. Um, of course, there were a few who didn't come in and were able to do it on their laptop pretty easily. Okay. Um, so there weren't um, any problems there. Um, it went pretty smoothly um, having those students in there and we were able to figure out all their um, technical difficulties and teaching them things, you know, that they might've forgotten, like using the control alt to zoom in and uh, look at things more closely. Uh, and then the, the third experiment, which was probably the most complicated, was the titration experiment. And we did that um, fully by Second Life. Um, that went pretty good um, as well. So it kind of demonstrated that the students learned well enough to take on a more complicated experiment like the titrations, uh, where they had several steps and uh, several different uh, things to do. Right. So for the titration lab, this was right after Thanksgiving. Um, I did have two students. One had a Chromebook uh, as her um, computer. So um, I had her come into the lab uh, and do the experiment. Another had uh, just weird problems with his computer that Second Life would run and had him come into the actual lab. 
Uh, but out of the 120 students, those were the only two students and they were alone in the labs. Uh, we took all the chemicals out so there wasn't any really danger in there. They were just using them as computers. But everyone else was either at home um, you know, or wherever. I, I don't know where people were, do were doing their second life from. But for the titration experiment, which was arguably one of the most complicated experiments that they did in Second Life, um, it was fiddly. Um, they, they seemed to come through it like troopers. Yeah, they, um, they did pretty well, I would think. You know, and when they had issues, we were able to figure those out um, wherever they were. Um, the chat function on here, you know, like the speak um, was very useful. And right, so the voice. Yes. Uh, most of them um, had that. Even the ones who didn't with the chat were able to get their point across and ask questions and get answers. Awesome. So do you think do you think that uh, do you think that this was a success for uh, teaching this semester? I think so. You don't um, have to say that because I pay you or anything. <laughs> I do think so. I do. <laughs> I do think that it was a success, especially during the um, obviously during the pandemic. Um, you know, our university we were off between Thanksgiving and the end of the semester, so we had that Second Life Lab during that time where there were no in-person classes, and I think it was. Um, good for engaging those students during that two week period, um, especially. Awesome. Awesome. So I don't know um, what the plans are going to be in the future. Um, but I think, you know, this could be um, helpful even, even in non pandemic times. Well, the, you know, talking about the pandemic, I ended up having um, a few students quarantine each week. I think the most I ever had quarantine because of exposure or because of testing positive was about eight students in one week. Uh, so, you know, out of 120, only eight students. It kind of uh, ramped up during uh, the semester until about October. It was like one or two a week, then three or four, then four or five, then up to eight. And then it ramped down for the rest of the semester. So, so yeah, um, let's see. Have I gotten student feedback? I'm going to get student evaluations in the uh, spring. It's our policy not to let faculty see their student evaluations until after grades have been assigned. Uh, so sorry that folks are having uh, trouble with uh, the, the music screen. Um, yes, I did the scripting, uh, but not for everything. I essentially did the scripting um, for the entire of the solid state activity, which is over where I'm standing now. Um, and, you know, the moderate amounts of scripting for making um, the huge models appear, um, you know, and having them do a few things. I'm, I'm comfortable with scripting. Uh, it takes me a little while, but, uh, you know, um, and doing anything worthwhile in Second Life does take a does take a, um, a long time, uh, you know. And I'm glad there's sandboxes um, set up because you know when you have um, when you script things to make objects appear and you forgot that uh, they're self-referential sometimes that may fill up a whole region with uh, with atoms. It didn't happen to me, but. I, I caught myself before uh, some that, that, that it could have. Yeah. Um, let's see. Dustin, is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, yeah. I guess I can um, maybe answer some of the questions that you, you guys have. So I'd probably want to talk about some of the challenges that we faced for each of, our, each of the experiments. Um, like I said, with that first experiment, um, the molar mass of butane, that one probably went the most smoothly. Uh, but then again, I think that was probably the most simple experiment. Um, the solid state models. Uh, so that was our second lab. Um, so that was a tough subject. Um, and students seem to have some problems with the Miller indices. Okay. Um, I don't know if that was just their, they haven't been exposed to it. So when they were looking at the, you know, the one, one, one diagonal cuts, 
uh, some of them were cutting it the wrong way. Right. So that, so that was pretty common. I can, I can, I can clarify that part. Um, so the lab is a separate course from the class. And most students are taking them both together. In the class, they hadn't gotten to solid state um, models ever or solid state stuff by the time we ran our solid state experiment. Um, the plan was that they would see it at the same time, but um, the class got bogged down a little bit. That's uh, the best laid plans of, of mice and TAs. Uh, and in fact, all of the Miller indices stuff would have come from uh, the pre-labs and the supplemental materials I gave them. Miller indices are kind of important for engineers to know about, but we don't have much of it at all in the uh, regular freshman chem textbooks. Yeah. Um, so I think using those pre-lab videos and um, it was nice for them, especially when they're at home, to be able to you know, if they forgot how to do something, I think it was really nice for them to be able to go back and do that. Um, because when you're working in person, you might not be able to, you know, have your other materials available to you. Um, you know, when you're working with hydrochloric acid or something, you don't want to be, you know, looking through your binder. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I think that was um, really nice. Um, I do think that the solid state experiment is just as valuable, if not more valuable, as the in-class solid state experiment. So I think that they learned, um, they were able to interact with the models a little bit more in Second Life um, as compared to in person. And it's quicker awesome to make to as well. That's really awesome to hear that it's quicker to make and, and that, yes. they, that you think they've... Uh, that they, they learned something, because uh, because that's definitely the goal. Um, we were also thinking of the VSCPR type uh, models, um, but, and I would have, and, and there's a, plenty of stuff that is already in existence for, oh, when I say VSCPR, it's, the acronym is Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory, and it's really a theory of why molecules have the shapes that they do, but there's plenty of, um, um, activities already in Second Life that uh, cover that particular content um, and, that I could have made an experiment about. But I had a discussion with the uh, Eric Voss, who's uh, Dr. Voss teaches the classroom part, and he had been hitting that um, material hard in several different other venues already for the class. So I didn't see a need to uh, put yet another um, um, activity for, for that particular topic. So, um, so at, at this point, I think we've s seen everything that the region pretty much has to offer. You sh can feel free to wander around. Uh, um, I, I put a gold nanoparticle up in the mountain somewhere. Uh, you can use your cameras to find that. Uh, you know, there's gold in them that are hills. Uh, that's an Easter egg. Um, each of the other 12, I mean, there's 12 platforms, but they're all identical to this one. So, you know, you can, if you have the HUD, you can, can wander up and look. I guess uh, if, if, if anyone's got the HUD on, um, I can click on the call for assistant button. You can see that, you know, platform one has lit up on the HUD if you happen to have that on. It just lights up in red. And then you teleport over to um, the platform where students are calling you, and then you can shut the uh, shut the call button off and, and talk to the students. That's a really nice aspect that Zandi and Random came up with for um, managing managing uh, students and TAs. Um, let's see. So at this point, uh, look through the chat and answer questions. Um, uh, Saturno is asking, did you experience any hardware constraints? Do your students need dedicated GPU for these experiments? Um, no, I think that the students uh, were um, able to get into Second Life uh, and run um, Second Life and do the experiments uh, without any uh, problems. Um, I mean, 
out of my 120, there were only two uh, who didn't seem to be able to uh, have the hardware available to them to be able to do the experiments. And I would have let them, and I did let them uh, into, into the lab. So any other questions? I think we have one from Ariane. She's asking if uh, they can visit here again. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, over that. Yeah, the, uh, the region's open. Uh, I only close it when we have actual teaching activities happening. And uh, yesterday was the last week of classes. Our classes start up, oh, January 19th. And, you know, I would probably, I would probably keep the region open for the entire spring semester. If I teach my Chem 410 class up here, um, I'll... Uh, well, maybe shut the region twice a week for an hour or something like that each time. But uh, otherwise, it's your anyone is uh, everyone is welcome. Okay. Uh, Tag asked me a question about um, electronic configuration of uh, species. That sounds like a really wonderful thing. That uh, um, actually, I saw it developed on the ACS islands back when there was an ACS island. Uh, and so that actually, that what you're asking about actually is exists in someone's inventory. Um, I would just have to hunt them down and figure out, um, you know, a nice place to put it. Let's see, other questions. Huh. Yeah. I think laptops are getting better and better. Uh, Dustin, uh, Dustin was surprised about being able to run Zoom and Second Life um, at the same time. Yeah, mine, uh, um, my laptop is, you know, just a inexpensive Lenovo with an i3 processor, and it's doing Zoom and Second Life um, as we speak. So, um, so there shouldn't be too many laptops out there that uh, don't run this for sure. Right. Yeah, my older laptop um, that I got, I think 2010 or something like that, I was running Zoom and Second Life at the same time. I got a new laptop recently because it was getting, uh, I was running like four or five major uh, memory pig programs at the same time and it was getting slow. So um, the, the regular, Ariane, we use the regular Second Life viewer for students. Um, you know, I just kind of went through the official site. That was a mistake. Um, I'll tell you why. We had one section Wednesday afternoon where um, Linden Labs would either shut the region off for 20 minutes or during the lab release a new update. And uh, I would actually have to uh, come into the lab and update all the uh, computers. Um, and, um, you know, then students could do their uh, labs again. So I'm going to have one lab section who's had a hard time with Second Life and all the rest have had an easy time. Um, Firestorm doesn't, it, it, Firestorm doesn't insist that you um, update um, you know, as often as the uh, regular Second Life viewer does. And I know you can turn that feature off on the regular Second Life uh, viewer, but uh, that wasn't something I was able to get done during the semester. What would happen if Linden Life altered uh, SL barometric pressure or sea level? Um, well, I, I think the reg most of the region might get flooded if they raised sea level. Um, I think the um, atmospheric pressure uh, on the platforms is just coded into the uh, barometer. I don't think that um, the uh, barometer looks at what uh, Second Life's current atmospheric pressure is. It would be nice if it did. Sizzy, uh, can I compare how well students learn with a sim and not using with a sim? Um, from this semester data, I can't. Uh, 
you know, but from what um, Dr. K and, um, you know, um, and uh, Kurt published uh, a while back, uh, their results were that the actual in-person version of the experiment and the second life version of the experiment were about equal in terms of um, how well students learned. And in fact, in their paper, one of their major comments from students was that uh, the second life would make a great um, pre-lab activity so that students would come into the lab and be able to do their titrations really fast and then go away. Let's see, what was I looking for from the old ACS region? Uh, they had a, um, they had a, uh, um, they, they had an activity that basically showed electronic configurations, gas phase electronic configurations of all the elements. So Barragon is asking about the wind, and um, we had a talk about uh, wind power in Second Life not too long ago, I think. Um, so I think there is wind in Second Life already. Dustin, would you like to add anything? Any final thoughts? Uh, I don't have too many final thoughts. Um... It was just nice to um, be able to teach synchronously uh, without being in person. Um, and it was nice to not have to worry about telling the kids to, or a lot of the students to put on their goggles and keep their masks on and didn't have to worry about any safety things like that. Oh yeah, uh, masks was, really was a nice. whole thing, right? Uh, I had forgotten about that. Did you have a problem with telling students about masks? Uh, early on, oh thing? yeah, I had to <laughs> tell them, you know, get it up over your face. <laughs> it's not a chin strap. Right, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Cool, and and the, and it doesn't help with the goggles. It makes them fog up. Yep. So if we were being real hardcore about it, I suppose we could have insisted on goggles in the second life part, but you know, having having that amount of detail um, just kind of seemed unnecessary to me. Let's see. Um, does using the sim degrade their safety skills in real life? Um, I think um, activity and um, walking into a lab where there are things that. can actually get on you uh, and you know in terms of actual real life stuff when we're in the lab we uh, do impress on them how uh, serious safety is um, so I don't I don't think I don't think the, the the two are necessarily connected I'm not a real big fan um, for totally online activities for learning how to do chemistry. There is a lot of hands-on stuff that we do that just can't be taught without kind of that kinematic aspect to it. Uh, like Dustin, when we're in the research lab and you're working with a vacuum line, um, do you think that working on a vacuum line in Second Life would give you the nearly the same sort of experience? Uh, definitely not, because they're uh, wouldn't be any consequences for doing bad things in Second Life where when you're working with the vacuum line, you can definitely, um, you definitely need to be paying close attention. Yeah, because it can explode or yes. you can catch fire <laughs> or, you know, if you're not wearing your goggles uh, and it explodes, you get glass shards uh, in your face. Uh, so, so that part's really serious. On the other hand, you know, you have to know how to do this safely because uh, you know you're trying to do significant things towards your getting your master's thesis. Um, but if I wanted to give someone the you know a taste of using like a vacuum line um, experiment, a second life taste might be a good sort of introduction and a safe way of doing it. So I think. I think there's definitely a place uh, 
for the second life content and the real life content to interact. But if you're going to be a professional in chemistry, then you got to have the hands on. We got to be able to teach people how to uh, do the hands on stuff without uh, hurting themselves or others. Yeah, I think it was um, the second life is helpful, especially for these. Um, our class was engineering chemistry. So these students might not work, you know, in the chemical field, but they still need to have the theoretical knowledge and know how this, how these things work. So I think um, the theoretical knowledge from Second Life is still pretty good for them. Yeah. So, you know, once we're, once we're back doing real things uh, in, you know, once we're back uh, doing in-person labs without uh, COVID-19, I assume our labs are going to go back up to 24 people. Uh, the second life activities um, will, I think, have a place. There's plenty of times when a student has to miss a lab because they're sick. Uh, if we have a similar lab in second life, they can do that as a makeup, uh, you know, and uh, even the even doing the second life type experiments as a uh, pre lab activity uh, can help them. Um, and you know, as the as Dustin, as you said, for the solid state activity, it was actually probably superior to the in person version. Yeah, I just think it was easier for the students, and actually, I think it would take less time because. I remember from last year when I was teaching uh, in person, a lot of the students went over their, you know, two hours and 50 minute time period for that lab and were really struggling with it. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we could make this into more of a video game where, you know, uh, someone catches fire and runs around and, um, you know, and there are consequences. Uh, but, you know, having unpleasant consequences when you just kind of enter your video game lab, uh, that's, that's kind of harsh for a, a freshman lab. You know, if I were doing this for a fourth year students, uh, I, I'd love to build more of that kind of stuff in. Um, Max had a com comment here, or there's a snowstorm and the campus is closed. I saw something come by, um, you know, essentially, because we're supposed to be doing everything online now after Thanksgiving, uh, they told us, uh, yeah, uh, you're not canceling your classes if it snows because you're in your basement anyway. Okay, um, that was kind of fun. So I see it's getting to about an hour and 20 minutes in. Uh, maybe, it, are there any last questions? Awesome. I'm not seeing any uh, last questions. So I want to thank everyone for uh, coming today and uh, for your for your attention. I'd like to thank Dustin for being a good sport and co-presenting with me. I think uh, hearing your perspective as uh, someone who was doing the direct work with uh, the students, I was just coordinating the labs and trying to make sure that there was a good environment for learning to happen. Having both of our uh, perspectives I think was uh, very good for today. Yeah, I'm glad to do it. Thanks Great. for inviting me in. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, what I'm going to do at this point is uh, stop our uh, Zoom stream and ice cast and uh, probably uh, wander off. So I hope everyone has a great weekend and I hope you all stay safe. All right. See you guys All later. Right. Okay.